Welcome everyone to our continuing study in the book of Proverbs. Today we're uh, planning on finishing off the last part of Proverbs 30, uh, which means uh, if you've been keeping track, there's one more chapter to go. Um, again, it's going to be full of insights, but today is going to be full of some pretty amazing insights as well. And so um, let's just lay down a foundation of prayer before we begin. Please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've created. Every day that you've created is beautiful, Father. Uh, what is so spectacular, Lord, is that every detail in every life, in every cell, in every atom in this universe you've created is accounted for and planned. And Father, it just gives us so much comfort that we don't have to sit and worry and fear because we know that you are God and you're on the throne. And so thank you for loving us so much that you not only look after us, but you tell us ahead of time that you look after us. So we're comforted by that. Thank you, Lord, for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask for a fresh and filling this morning that we might quiet our hearts from the things that occupy us in this life and be able to focus on you and your word and what you have here for us this morning. We just ask these things and lift this time to you in the powerful name of your Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as you see from the opening questions, there's a lot of, of variety of topics that we're going to cover in just nine verses. So let's just uh, jump in this morning. And uh, I want to cover these in some groups of verses. Um, so it may seem like, be, we, you know, wow, we're going to be done really quickly, not so fast. Uh, there's a lot here. So Proverbs 30, verses 24 to 28 say this. There are four things which are little on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. The rock badgers are a feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crags. The locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. The spider skillfully grasps with his hands, and it's it is in king's palaces. And so we read that and we sort of say, okay, this is going to talk a little bit about some of the creatures that God created, but I'd like us to look at a couple of things before we get into those specific animals that are being talked about. First of all, the Hebrew is written right to left. And if you look at the Hebrew, you're going to see a couple of things. First thing you should probably note is that there are three different um phrases or words inserted here that are not in the original language. You see those, uh, if you start over at the far right, you see that with the word B, and underneath it, Strong's Concordance number 9999. Strong's Concordance is a system of numbering words in either the Hebrew or Greek so that we can find every other place that that exact word form is being used and help us to better understand what we're actually reading. So you you have that. But I want to draw your attention all the way to the far left of this because you have an interesting thing happening here. First of all, it's going to, it, it, in the English, it says wise exceeding. And so we look at that and it in, in the English, the New King James, it's exceedingly wise. And it's the word chakam, chakam. Because when you look at the root word for each of these words, 2449 is the primitive root word, which means is chakam, which is a to be wise, it's a verb. And 2450, chakam, same spelling, is to be skillful with cunning. Now, the fact that we look at these words, remember, we've been studying Proverbs, and since the very beginning, we learned that the word for wisdom Strong's number 2451 is chakma, which means it's, it's, the, it's the word for the pounding in, the repetition that's required for learning wisdom and being able to acquire wisdom and store it up. So these words are all related. And so that would catch our attention just because of that, that double, the, the chakam chakam. And when you state something twice in the Hebrew, it's a way to magnify the phrase and emphasize, emphasize rather the exceeding and unexpected degree, in this case, of the skill and cunning 
of these creatures that are specifically mentioned. Now, this is not a complete list of the creatures. It's a synecdoche. It's a, it's, it's a sublist, if you will. And the other thing we should understand that whenever we look at Scripture, when we see lists in Scripture, we just looked at one last time, which was an X plus. It was three, no four, or six, yet seven. And so here, we don't have that structure. This is not an X plus one list. And when we looked at an X plus one list, it was you list, if it's a list of four, you list three things, and then the fourth is emphasized. Well, in this case, none of these four are emphasized, although someone could say, well, let's look at the first one that you start with, which is the ant, and that could possibly be. You may also, as we study this particular passage, realize that there's another word that we have to look at much more closely or another creature that we have to look at more closely to see what this particular passage in Proverbs is connecting us to. Remember, everything in the Bible is connected to everything else in the Bible, and especially in Proverbs, it's not a random series of thoughts that are disjointed, but rather a very cleverly woven together fabric of thoughts that are all connected. So let's take this apart. In what way are each of these creatures exceedingly wise? What's, what's Solomon's point? What's he trying to make here? Well, the second question I want to answer first, because we, we need to look at each one of these creatures, but what's his point with the list? First thing is that each of these animals were quite common to Israel. They were well known as common. So in this part of the country, the eastern United States, another month or two, what do we see outside on our lawns? Robins. We're very used to seeing them. So we don't necessarily, oh, my word, there's a robin. It's a very common sight. So we see these, and these are very common animals to, uh, to, to Israel. Now, some of these we know, and some of those we think we know, and some of them we may not even realize what they are. So remember that when God created each one of these animals, he hardwired them to possess certain instincts and tendencies that make them seem to have wisdom and skill and cunning in the way that they go about living their, their lives. They have a life cycle, they have a habitat, they have certain patterns that you can observe as you look at these animals. And remember, Solomon is sharing observations that he has made over the time that he has done his studying. Now, the whole point of the passage is to get the reader or hearer to consider each animal and how wise or skillful or cunning they are, but for us to give God the glory for the way that God created them. That's really the purpose behind this list of four. We're to give God the glory. We're to look at these things and say, you know what, there's more than meets the eye. This is pretty, it's a pretty amazing set of skills that this particular creature has. Now, fools and scorners and wicked people they're so self-focused, self-absorbed that they don't even notice what's going on. They would consider such animals as tiny, insignificant, worthless, roadkill. They would just not look at and, and stop and consider what God has actually created and the design that he put into each one of his creations. The fact is that Romans 1 gives us a treatise on how God reveals himself in creation. Even if we didn't have scripture, we should be able to go ahead and look at these four groups of creatures and be able to see God with his invisible qualities and characteristics of the way that he designed each of these creatures so that we would have proof that there is a creator. It's not these things just didn't appear by themselves. There was, in fact, a creator. So let's take a look at this first passage, verse 25. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. Now we read that, we go, okay, well, you know, how much strength does an ant have? Huh, interesting. Now we recall, we, we studied ants in Proverbs 6, 7 through 11. So it's an opportunity for me to remind you that if you want to go back and look at that study again, we have it on our churchlh.com slash streaming site. And you can go there and uh, take a look at everything in the book of Proverbs, also everything in the book of Psalms that we've studied together for the last couple of years. So you can go ahead and check that lesson out. Now, the more we learn about ants, the more they seem exceedingly wise. What am I talking about? 
Well, first of all, it says here that the ants are a people not strong. Now, any of you look at an ant, when's the last time that you look at an ant and were like, whoa, I don't know if I can handle this. Wow, that ant's pretty tough. That ant might beat me up. None of us are going to look at an ant. We're going to just dismiss it as this little thing we can hardly see. We're not going to fear their strength, but we should, because an ant proportionately is incredibly strong for its size. It can carry 50 times its weight. That would be like you going out and grabbing a limousine and picking it up and carrying it around on your back. That's the strength that it, a single ant has. They are strong, but we don't see them strong because what do we do? We look at the outside and we say, well, they're not big, nothing intimidating, but they are incredibly strong. They're well organized. They're highly disciplined in their work. They perform their work with military precision better than any of us could probably claim in, the own, in our own careers and vocations that we have. This also says they prepare their food in the summer. D despite their tiny size, they very wisely organize their year around the different seasons of the year. Now, ants perform their, their work based on a weather cycle. Now, you should know that um, compared here to the mid-Atlantic states on the east coast of the United States, Israel's a little bit colder. It's a little bit colder. It has a little bit higher elevation, so you also have that going for you. And so ants work based on, on the weather cycle. So they do their food gathering in this, the warmer months, and they work around the clock. There's no fools among ants, there's no sluggards among ants, and there's no gossips among ants. They focus on their work, they, they do it with military precision. They take about a one minute power nap, that a series of these throughout the day, that total about five hours of rest per day. So they will work 24 hours in a day, but they'll have these mini naps of one minute or so. So the next time you look at a group of ants, you're going to see some ants stop. And they just sort of stop for a minute, and then they start going again. They've just taken, you've just witnessed a power nap of an ant. And this happens in the warm weather seasons. They hibernate during the cold weather months, and they live off the food that they stored in the warm weather months. So from a wisdom standpoint, they work when it's opportune to work, and then they sleep and hibernate when it's not. And so they seem exceedingly wise in that process. Nobody had to tell them they don't go to ant school to learn this. They don't have to go through, you know, 12 grades of, of former formal education to learn this. They don't get a diploma from a school. They, they are high, hardwired with this wisdom that God, their creator, imbued them with. All right. 26, the rock badgers. You probably have not ever run, a, run across a rock badger. The rock badgers are a feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crags. You see a picture of them there. Cute little guys. So these are the species Hyrax syriacus. Hyrax syriacus. They're squat, don't have very big legs. They're thick furred, incredibly thick furred, about 20 inches long. They weigh seven to nine pounds. They're native to Israel and other parts of the Middle East. So you can go out into the areas that have cliffs and crags, and you can actually see these guys scurry and scamper. Now, they're interesting. They're, they're a feeble folk. As you can see, just based on the pictures there, small round ears, short stubby legs, you're not going to be intimidated by a rock badger if you happen to come across a rock badger. Again, it's going to be like being intimidated by a squirrel. I don't know, maybe some of you have squirrel phobias, but that we're, it's not something that we would typically be intimidated by. Now, their paws, interestingly enough, God designed them to allow them to scramble across rocks with great speed. I mean, these guys motor relative to size. They move very, very rapidly. Now, they're social animals. They live in colonies from anywhere from 10 to maybe 80 of them uh, that will live in a colony. They're largely defenseless creatures. They have to hide from both flying and cliff-dwelling predators. And so you can think about the fact that you and I usually see what's coming ahead of us. They have to worry about what's overhead. And they have to worry about what they don't see that might be hidden by the rocks overhead. 
So they have to be very much aware, but they're able to rapidly move over the surface of a rock. They make their homes in crags. And we see in the picture, just like you see there, they hide these little tiny spaces. So there's just enough of a space there for these guys to line up six or seven or 10 or 80 of them right across in a row. And so that's one of the things you look at and go, that's pretty wild to get all these little faces looking at you. So socially, they follow this, a friend of a friend is also my friend, philosophy or behavior. And so if the, they, they're social, and so they don't tend to go, well, I don't like this guy, you know, he's got bad breath, this guy doesn't wash himself regularly, you know, they, none of this kind of stuff. They focus on being together as a family, taking each other as they are. Levitically, they're unclean, so they're not a clean animal from a Levitical standpoint. Although they do chew the cud, and chewing the cud is one of the standards that was required for a Levitically clean animal. And they are primarily eating plants. They're not a carnivore or an omnivore. They're primarily eating plants. But they're perfectly designed by God for their environment. And so when we look at these guys and we observe them, we see how much they seem exceedingly wise in the way that they behave in the habitats in which you'll find them. So again, remember, there's four things that are little on earth, but they're exceedingly wise. I'm going to skip one, come back to it in just a second. I want to go to the spider. The spider skillfully grasps with its hands and is in king's palaces. It is in king's palaces. So how is a spider exceedingly wise? Well, let's take a look here. The spider, there are over 48,000 known species of spider. They're found, by the way, on every continent but Antarctica. So if you have arachnophobia, you could move to Antarctica and not have to worry about it. But you probably have to dress warmly. Now, the spider here, it says, skillfully grasps with its hands. You see, if you look at your hand, it is a marvel of design. Your hand is an incredible designed machine, if you will. We have opposable gr thumbs to grasp. What a spider does is has eight legs that it uses to grasp things. In fact, it can independently control how each one of the legs of the spider can operate in very specific situations with whatever it's doing. These eight legs have very specific functions, and they're going to be useful in helping the spider to build its nest, helping the spider to eat, helping the spider to rest, helping the spider to move from here to there. Now, a spider's grasp is proportionately stronger than a human hand. So if you go out and shake Mac, Matt Dieter's hand one day and see it feels like you're shaking a hand with, with a vice, he's very, very strong. Well, a spider proportionately would be stronger. A spider is very, very strong based on its size. Now, in king's palaces, it's interesting. The king's the most powerful human on the planet, and yet he can't keep a spider from making a nest in the palace. You know, he can't say, I'm going to issue an edict, and no spiders are allowed to make a nest here. They do. In fact, a 2017 study says that the average human house has about 61 spiders. I know most of you are probably not looking to have a nest of spiders in your house, but your house has spiders. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you that today. So you have them. They're common. You can't keep them out. You could do all sorts of stuff. You're not going to be able to keep them out, not, not permanently. See, you and I see the evidence of the spider before we actually see the spider. If you go and look at the corners of your, your rooms and along the baseboard and you come across the spider nest and like, there's no spider. And you never saw anything going on, but you see the, the spider's web, the evidence. See, the silk of a web is amazingly strong. It's elastic, it's lightweight, and there's nothing that man has ever been able to make that, it's, it, that is its equal. I mean, it's an incredible, incredible substance yet the spider spins it you go ahead and take out a web and we see this in the autumn around this area they'll make a web outside and you go ahead and knock it down the next morning it's back up I mean, these guys build they're incredible builders web designs by the way are totally unique one from another there are no two that are alike it takes patience and creativity and man can't replicate this 
as much as he thinks he's all that smart. See, you and I can't help but marvel at the wisdom of God and the creativity of his creation when we look and open our eyes and consider you. This is Solomon's point. Now, I skipped one. Let me go back to verse 27. The locusts have no king, yet they advance in ranks. Well, most of us see grasshoppers here, and some would actually qualify as being part of the locust family, but a, there's a lot of locusts out there. This the word here in Hebrew is arbe, arbe, A-R-B-E-H. It's a locust or a grasshopper. The Hebrew root of this word, arbe, is rabah, and that means abundance, increase, multiply rapidly. It's a word that would be associated with locusts because locusts will swarm from time to time. And so we see a picture here over in the Middle East of a locust swarm. That's what it looks like. And they're thick. And you can literally, you would have locusts just all around you if you were that man walking in the locust swarm. Locusts, by the way, are largely solitary creatures. They don't hang out in a group. But under certain conditions, an increased levels of melatonin in their brain will cause them to breed rapidly, become quite voracious and gregarious. You'll, you, you'll watch this behavior happen. Of the 1,000 plus species, 27 of those thousand are notorious for swarming. 27 of those. Now, a locust swarm can contain millions or billions of individual locusts. There are some that are clouds several miles wide and a mile thick, and you can see them out over the ocean when they're coming towards you, and it's rather a scary sight. You can hear the sound of them. But it says here, locusts have no king. Now, ants and bees have a queen. But locusts have no king. They're not, there's no ruler. There's no central individual locust that says, okay, I'm running for election this, uh, this fall. And, uh, you know, if, if you elect me, I'll have you do this, this. No, no, there's no, there's no leader, no king. Yet they all advance in ranks. And so this is very much what you see when a swarm takes place. When a sw swarm takes place, it's almost as if they received military intelligence with precision by the way they actually move across the ground and consume everything that's in their sight. They will follow this, this military precision and devour all the vegetation. Just like if they had some central command that was telling you, you take out everything. There's nothing left. In fact, after a locust swarm has been at work, what you find is this white ash-like substance that looks like a fire burned everything. In fact, in the Middle East, they call the locusts the burners of the field. That's the, a, a label that they give them, the burners of the field, just to be able to explain this white ash-like residue. They take everything. See, verse 30, Proverbs 30, 27 has disturbed biblical scholars for centuries because it seems to contradict something that we read in Revelation 9, 11. The Bible's an integra integrated book. It can't have a contradiction. So let's take a look at this a little closer. The locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. But if you take a look at the passage beginning with Revelation 9, 11, actually 9, 1 to 11, but 11 is the, is the point that you want to look at here. 9, 1 to 11 says the fifth angel, this is talking about the judgments on planet Earth during Daniel's 70th week. The fifth angel sounded and I st saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Describing the effect of this locust swarm being between where the person is that is seeing this in the vision and where the sunlight was. A huge locust storm. Verse 3. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. They came upon the earth. Interesting. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Ooh, these are not nice locusts. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Ooh. 
and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They'll desire to die, and death will flee from them. Now get this. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. They had hair like a woman's hair. Their teeth were like a lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. This is a description of a locust here. And this, the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They are loud. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. I get this. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Oh, what's going on here? And when you look at this, you realize that this last verse contradicts what Proverbs 30, 30, 27 says. The locusts have no king. Well, what's going on here? When you look at what's going on here, you have to come to a couple of really key conclusions. First of all, are these actual regular locusts like you see flying around in your backyard? Answer, no. They're not the same species. One is a regular locust that God created something. The locusts of 3027 are God's creation. No king. But the locusts of Revelation 9, 1 through 11 are demonic beings from the pit of hell. They take on the form of a locust, but a supernatural form, quite scary. If we saw one of those things, big size, we would like die. It's scary. These have a king over them. It's the king of the bottomless pit. Oh, it's different. You see, there's, we have to look at this. There's something more going on here. It's a remez. It's something under the surface. And so we have this, this passage in Amos 7.1. I'm giving you, the again, the Hebrew of Amos 7.1. Now, when you and I read this from the Masoretic source text, the source of the Hebrew, if we render it in English, Amos 7.1 says, Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. Now, I'm not sure what you do with that. Except if you take a look at this in the Septuagint Greek, the translation from the Hebrew to the Greek, here's the English rendering of that, and you're going to find that they're quite different. The Septuagint translation in 270 BC renders the Hebrew of Amos 7 1, the Lord hath shown me, and behold, a swarm of locusts were coming, and behold, one of the young devastating locusts was Gog the king. And we look at that and go, all right, what's going on? Why, why do our Bibles not say that? Well, for one thing, we have translations of Bibles, and here is very clearly a translator's error. You know, one of the things that we, one of the reasons why the King James is so good to use as a study Bible, and I would hold that the New King James is just a more easily read version of it, is that most of the errors are well known at this point in time. You can actually find them and you can actually look at them. But when you start to look at them in the original language, that's when things get really interesting. Gog the king. Does the name Gog sound familiar to you at all? Those of you who are Bible students, there's much more going on here than meets the eye. That's why it's a remez. The Holy Spirit who authored all scripture embedded a connection between the Bible's principal book on applying wisdom, Proverbs, and end times prophecies foretold by Ezekiel and Amos and John, who wrote Revelation, about the events of our future. There's something going on here. Who says you can't have a lot of fun looking at prophecy in Proverbs? You can. Right here we are. So let's take a closer look. Consider the translation of the uh, 7-1, Amos 7-1 and Revelation 9, 1-9, as we consider these passages about Gog. 
Ezekiel 38, 1 to 6 says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, this is the, the term that God uses for the prophet Ezekiel. It's not Jesus Christ, son of man, but son of man. This is a title that he gave to Ezekiel. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army and horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and his troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. We read that, and there's Gog right there in the middle of this. Well, what, what's going on? So here's a map, and you'll see Rosh, which is described here, which is part of Russia today, part of the old Soviet Union. Magog was also part of that. But you have Af Afghanistan and Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, Put, Kush, uh, Meshach, uh, which is right there, is, is part of um, uh, Turkey today. And so when we look at that and we look at these names that are being used, we begin to see the, the countries that are involved on this tiny, this, this invasion, soon to be invasion, right there in the tiny middle of that, you're going to see a little green, dark green sliver that's Israel, who is going to be the subject of this invasion of Ezekiel 38, and again in Ezekiel 39, different invasion. Now, Gog was identified in Amos as a demon king who existed, by the way, in the days of Amos when he wrote that about 790 B.C. Gog, Ezekiel calls him the prince of Rush, the prince of Russia, which I believe when you look at the book of Daniel, for example, and see these different demons that seem to be behind world powers, I see this as the demonic power that's behind the human leader of Rosh or, or Russia. That's why it's one of the reasons why we understand what it is. It's Russia. It's that particular area that we see described in red. In Revelation 9, 1 to 9, John identified the demon king with two languages, Abaddon in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek. It's the destroyer. Okay, getting interesting. Let's just take a, another look at something else in the next chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 39, 1 to 5. We'll take a look at this. And you, son, and you, son of man, prophesy against Gog. There we are again. And say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you, from, bringing you up from the far north bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand, cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand, and you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey. Get this. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall in the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. All right, we read that. We still don't have total clarity, but now a little more of the picture is beginning to come into focus. Gog here again is identified as the Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, making him again the demonic power behind localized human rule. Why do I say that? Because Ezekiel was more than 100 years after Amos was written. And last time I looked, we don't have too many people that live more than 100 years. We don't have too many rulers that are ruling for more than 100 years or more than 20 or 30 or four or two or whatever the case may be. See, this sounds very much like what John described in Revelation 19 as the great supper of God that follows the invasion of Israel in Daniel's 70th week, just prior to Satan being bound for a thousand years and chained in the abyss. So we could begin to connect these things to, well, when did John write? John wrote about 95, 97 BC. 
BC, Amos, 798 BC, John, 95 AD, sorry, AD. We're talking 900 years spread. Ah, but John's talking about something that's going to happen at least 2,000 years from the time that he's writing it. So now we're talking about a 3,000 year spread. And we're still calling this person Gog? It ain't a human. Now look at this. Revelation 20, 7 through 9, when the thousand years are expired, that's after Satan has been bound, after Daniel's 70th week. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Well, now we're talking about something that we don't even know when the Daniel 70th week is going to begin. And this is more than a thousand years afterwards. We'll go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. The beast and false prophet have been in there for a thousand years at that point in time because that's what's their judgment at the end of Daniel's 70th week. Gog is a thousand plus years later, just prior to the great white throne judgment. We're not talking about a human power. We're talking about a satanic power. We're talking about a satanic power, a major power. Is it Satan? We don't know. Is it a chief lieutenant of Satan? Could be. But the point is, when we read this stuff, see, you and I sit there, we say, well, the locusts have no king, they advance, they, they advance in ranks. We look at that, we go, oh, oh, that's interesting. Point is, we're missing some of the stuff that God embedded in his word to try to catch our attention so that we are marveling at what he has done. You and I should be giving him the glory for what he has done, because what he has done is incredible and marvelous, and it boggles the human mind, but yet we see this as we look at his creatures, what he's created. Well, that was a nice side trip in the book of Proverbs. Let me get actually back to that. There are three things which are majestic. This is Proverbs 29, or 30, verse 29 and further. There are three things which are majestic in pace. Yes, four which are stately in walk. Well, that's a X plus one. That's a three plus four. Okay. Verse 30, a lion which is mighty among the beasts and does not turn away from any. A greyhound, a male goat also, and a king whose troops are with him. Interesting. Now, majestic in pace, yatab tasad means basically you would appear as beautiful, pleasing to the eye, skillful in pace. Like you look at the person's gait or walk, manner of walking, and you're like, wow. You know, it's like that world-class athlete that just moves with grace and fluidity. Stately in walk, yatab yalak, and yes, the yatab is used in both of these. It appears as beautiful, pleasing to the eye, but skillful in one's walk, the way they carry themselves. A slight difference, but they are two adjective descriptions of this walk, this stately walk. So why are each of these majestic in pace and stately of walk? Well, let's start with the lion. But first of all, remember that it's the X plus one structure that provides examples of creatures that carry themselves in supreme confidence and self-assurance. And the last one, the king whose troops are with him, the X plus one always says, pay attention to the first three, but pay, pay even closer attention to the fourth of the four. So a lion, he's the unquestionable king of the jungle. Now, where does the lion sleep? Answer, wherever he wants. See. If he's not hunting or fighting, when you watch a lion, they walk in a slow, 
deliberate pace with their head held high. They're just, you know, you're looking going, that's pretty majestic. You should watch a lion when they walk. Very majestic. Greyhounds, they're built for speed. They were the world's fastest dog in the day of Solomon. Greyhounds, by the way, are a bit shy and reserved, but they race very intensely and gracefully at top speed. You Again, you look at them and you're amazed at how fluid they are when they race. More fluid than racehorses. He goats. They're often idiomatic, by the way, of pride in scripture and arrogance because they strut, but they strut about the herd in supreme confidence, daring any rival to try to defeat him. Confident he's going to prevail. When you watch a he goat sort of strut through there, strut their stuff, you can see, again, stately in walk, stately in pace, stately majestic. Then you have this fourth one. Kings are usually on horsebacks when they're in troops. So they're elevated above the troops. And again, we didn't have mechanized vehicles except for the last 100 plus years, 120, 130, 140 plus years. Before then, the primary place that a king would be when they're leading their troops is on top of a horse. And they're supremely confident and invincible because well, why? They're surrounded by thousands of troops, hundreds of troops. They're right in the middle. They're leading them and they're surrounded by them and they don't really fear anything. You take away all of the troops and he's just out on horseback and he's not going to be quite as stately. So we're looking at this and so we get what this says, but what does it really mean? Well, what's Solomon trying to teach us? Always a good, good thing to look at the teaching point. So the first thing we should be doing is asking what makes each one of these creatures so confident when they're facing life? You know, many of them live by the law of the jungle. The lion lives by the law of the jungle. They don't know what's around the corner. It could be a poisonous snake. It could be a bigger lion. But they're confident. Why? Or what makes them so confident? How can they face their life with great confidence? But that also ought to make you and me stop and say, how do we face our life with confidence? You and I happen to be living in a very, very amazing time in human history. It's getting dark out there, folks. It's getting more complicated. It's getting scary. Yet, why is Solomon telling us this? He's telling us this, that you and I might walk in confidence, just like a lion and a greyhound and a he-goat and a horseback riding king. You see, our confidence meter ought to be very high as Christians. One of the things that ought to mark us is decidedly different than the rest of the world in which we live is that we should not be living with the fear that seizes most people. If you don't have a relationship with God, you will know fear. If you have a relationship with God, you have no fear. The fact is that you and I should have this confidence. But it's the relationship with God is the distinguishing characteristic between having the confidence and to have a stately walk and a majestic pace. Remember, the Proverbs is a treatise on wisdom. And wisdom is found only one place, in God's word. Wisdom is found only in God's word. It's a treatise on wisdom. Now get this, Habakkuk 3, 17, 19. You talk about facing tough times with confidence. Habakkuk says, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, nor or though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. See, the difference is God. The difference is God and the confidence of knowing that you are walking with the creator of the universe. Do you actually walk with him? Solomon is talking to you today about just that. What's your walk with God? 
Psalm 23, 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David. Paul in Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and remember, Hebrews 11, the Hebrew Hall of Faith talks about all of the people and gave you example after example of the people that walked with God in perilous times and yet were walking victoriously. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. By the way, fear could be there and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You and I are in a race. The fact is, we're in the race of the human race, if you will. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what our Jesus did. Our relationship is to be with the Lord. That's why the majestic pace... All throughout Proverbs, we've been getting doses of wisdom and doses of wisdom and doses of wisdom that continually point back to God. Here, Solomon is doing it in a different way to help us to see and grasp the understanding of this. We come to the final couple of verses. He says, if you've been foolish in exalting yourself, prideful, arrogant, or if you've devised evil, in other words, you've planned a sin, put your hand on your mouth. For as the churning of milk produces butter and the wringing the nose produces blood, so the forcing of wrath produces strife. Well, why is this particular passage a very fitting summary for the close of Proverbs 30? Proverbs 30 has been an incredible chapter in Proverbs, one of the deepest and most full of riddles and dark sayings and enigmas. I see these two verses, of course, connected with the previous passage about walking confidently in life. You see, if we walk confidently in life, that's one thing, but are we keeping our eyes on the Lord? Do we start to exalt ourselves. Hey, we're in a great shape. You know, got nothing to worry about. Everything's fine. Ah, that can lead us to pride and arrogance. Or if we're using that time when we're not thinking about the problems we have to solve, so ah, maybe I ought to do this or do that. It's something we're in an area we shouldn't be trafficking in. You see, if you've been foolish in exalting yourself or if you've devised evil, put your hand on your mouth. See, absent in walking in God's wisdom, his way, in his will, walking in confidence and self-assurance is walking in pride, arrogance, foolishness, and wickedness. God hates these things. Those things he detests. To put your hand on your mouth to, is a physical reaction that you have when you realize that you're going the wrong way or saying the wrong thing. You want to stop. To stop walking in the flesh and start walking in God's way. This is a very practical instruction for us, especially, you know, when do you get careless? When you're prideful, when you're confident and arrogant. Our confidence is in the Lord, not in us. Every step we make can be a bad step. We have to rely on God to make that next step that we take a good step. One that doesn't cause us to stumble or fall or be an ineffective witness. Verse 33, for as the churning of milk produces butter, you keep churning milk, eventually you're going to get some butter out of it. Or wringing the nose, twisting the nose produces blood. So the forcing of wrath produces strife. See, there's three certainties that are given here. First of all, when you churn milk long and hard enough, you get butter. Ring your nose hard enough, it's going to bleed. By the way, I'm not suggesting you try either of these. But if you did, you would find this would be the case. The forcing of wrath occurs when you walk in the flesh. You're literally forcing wrath when you choose to walk in the flesh. You choose to walk by sight and not by faith. 
you used to you choose to walk in a way that God has told you not to walk. You are forcing wrath. Sooner or later, it's going to bring you a conclusion. Strife, contention, and, and disharmony. It's going to happen. As sure as we're sitting there, sure as death and taxes. See, forcing of wrath never yields peace or love or joy or any of the fruit of the spirit. Forcing of wrath is you trying to do it on your own and trying to be in your humanness thinking you're wiser than our creator, and you're not. See, ungodly life choices always end badly. Again, as certain as death and taxes. I pray that God uses these lessons from this particular chapter in Proverbs as intense as it is and connecting Gog and Magog and all the things that we see here that we stop and think about what is our walk. You and I have been given the privilege as 21st century Christians to be given much of the story of history in the Bible and having lived through and having the benefit of hindsight of history to see what has come behind us. We have the word of God to direct us now in this next step. You and I need to think about that and think about the life to which God has called you because he's chosen to put you in your particular family, in your particular area of the country, in your particular vocation with the people that are, that are around you. He's chosen to put you there for a reason. And the reason is not for your personal aggrandizement or enjoyment, but it is to carry out a mission that he designed you very specifically for. He designed each of us as a specific creature for a specific mission on planet Earth that only you can fulfill. Now, will it all go to nothing if you don't do what you're supposed to do? No, God will make other arrangements, but he's given you first dibs on these things. So the question is, do you know what God has called you to do? Do you know what God has called you to have a purpose for? He's not created you just for the sake of, oh, yeah, we need some more people here. Yeah, this, the room's a little empty. Let's have some more people. No, no. You were designed with a very specific purpose. Why did he design you to have the specific skills and capabilities that you have? He designed you. Why did he design you to live in this particular era of time? Why not put you back in 316 AD or 5200 BC? Why did he choose you now? Why did he choose you to live in this part of the world? You see, there's a lot of questions that you and I should be asking about this, but the key point of this section of Proverbs 30, with as many questions as you as I have, our Lord, Jesus Christ, his Father, our Creator, and the Holy Spirit have given us answers. We have our hope and trust in them, not in the things of man. And this is really an incredible wake-up call before we go into study Proverbs 31, which is also going to be full of many unanticipated surprises. And so with this thought in mind, I'd just like to pray for a moment and just commend you to think about what we have taken a look at together these past few months. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this lesson today. We thank you for the truth of your word. You gave us your word. And you allowed us to be able to look at this word and see how it works and see how it's connected together and have taken us through these studies to realize that although there's very simple truth in everything that you say, there is deep truth in everything that you say. And there is greater truth than meets the eye on the surface of everything that you say. But you have a purpose for it. And you, again, you chose to place us here in this day and time in our particular communities, in our particular family for your, a reason of your purposes. And so, Father, I pray that together with your Holy Spirit, you would reveal to us the whys that we have been asking and grappling with about why does this happen and why does that happen and why are we here and why are we facing this? And 
Father, our confidence has to be in you. And we realize that as we look at passages like this today, we realize that you're in control of a plan and you've invited us to be part of that plan. And so, Lord, with your help and your guidance and your wisdom, we pray that you would allow us to be walking worthy of the name Christian, walking worthy in a world that needs light, that is darkening and darkening as each moment passes by. And you have allowed us to be light in this world and salt in this world. And so thank you, Father, for the high calling that you've given us. We just ask the strength and wisdom, insight, perception, prudence, understanding, all of these things that you share with us in the book of Proverbs, we ask these things that you would equip us to be equal to the task. These things we pray in the precious and powerful name of your Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and God's people said, Amen and Amen.